bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Holland Blurview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today's webinar is titled, The Chronic Pain Assessment Toolbox for Children with uh, Disabilities. And we've got a great panel from the Evidence to Care team at Holland, Bloor, Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. I'd also like to mention the uh, 2015 CAFC Annual Conference, which is coming up uh, October 18th to the 20th. And everyone is invited to join us in Quebec City, where we will learn and share our expertise in finding solutions in children's health care. Lots of information on the conference website, and you can always get the most up-to-date information there at conference.cafc.org. So hopefully you'll check that out, and hopefully we'll uh, get to meet some of uh, our webinar audience in person in Quebec City. All right, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce today's panel. I'm going to leave it to them to sort of uh, give uh, give us a little more information on their background. But uh, as I mentioned, we've got uh, four uh, people from the Evidence to Care team at Holland Bloorview uh, Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We have Christine Providenza, Ashley Townley, Dr. Shauna Kingsnorth, and Aaron Brandon. So it's my uh, uh, pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to the Evidence to Care team. Over to you guys. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Providenza, and I am a Knowledge Translation Specialist with Evidence to Care at Holland Bloorview. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning for this webinar. Today, we will be talking to you about what Evidence to Care is. We will also be introducing to you our Chronic Pain Toolbox for Children with Disability. As part of this discussion, we will be talking about what chronic pain is and the effects of chronic pain on children with disability specifically children with cerebral palsy. We will unpack how the toolbox was developed, implemented, and evaluated, and share the clinician's perspective on the toolbox. And we will also take you through a case study putting the toolbox into practice. We have several speakers with us today to talk about this work. We have with us Dr. Shauna Kings-North, who is the lead of Evidence to Care, and has led the development, implementation, evaluation, and dissemination of the chronic pain toolbox. We have Aaron Brandon, who is the clinical lead of the Complex Care Neuromotor Clinic and co-lead of the Complex Care Rett Syndrome Pathway Clinic. Aaron has played an important role in implementing the toolbox in her clinic, as well as helping to evaluate the work. We also have Ashley Townley, who is a knowledge broker with Evidence to Care, and myself. Both of us have played a pivotal role in the development, implementation, evaluation, and dissemination of the chronic pain toolbox. I will turn it over to Dr. Shauna Kingsworth to talk about evidence and care. Thank you, Christine. I'm going to start the presentation by offering some context about where this work took place and the program behind it. Today's speakers represent Holland Lurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. Located in Toronto, we are a provincial resource for clinical care, serving children with cerebral palsy, spina bifida, autism, concussion and acquired brain injuries, among many other physical and developmental disabilities. The hospital's vision is to create a world of possibilities for children with disabilities. So with respect to evidence to care, this, um, this organizational initiative really emerged in response to several system drivers, including Bill 46, the Excellent Care for All Act, and Health Quality Ontario, both of which are led by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, as well as the broader health movement around evidence-based medicine. In response to these, Holland Blurview has made a significant investment to strengthen the hospital's role as a producer, user, and promoter of research evidence in clinical practice through the launch of Evidence to Care in 2011. This organizational initiative is really designed to accelerate knowledge translation, or KT as it's commonly called, in childhood disability. 
would be aimed to advance and support an evidence-friendly culture where our staff, our families, and our clients turn to research evidence and feel comfortable doing so. Today we'll be talking about our model and how we're striving to influence clinical practice and policies that impact the health and well-being of children with physical disabilities in order to improve quality of care leading to optimal health outcomes. So evidence to care and the drivers behind it strongly reflect an emerging field that's commonly referred to as knowledge translation. And development of our evidence to care model has been strongly guided by the literature within this field. In particular, this definition provided by the National Center for the Dissemination of Disability Research, which is also strongly aligned with the Canadian Institutes for Health Research's definition, but tailored to our population of interest, people with disabilities. Key messages within this definition focus on collaboration, knowledge synthesis, and critically, the practical application of high quality research to influence care. These core activities are at the core of our knowledge translation model. So let's talk about this a bit more concretely. What does our model actually look like? On the ground, Evidence to Care is a specialized group of knowledge translation experts who work collaboratively with our clinical community, our families, and our community partners to bridge research, clinical care, and policy here at Holland Blair View. In line with how we conceive knowledge translation, we built a working model based on KT theory and used the knowledge to action cycle developed by Ian Graham and colleagues as the foundation for our work. We take on many roles to address KT within the hospital, be they consultative, collaborative, or leadership in order to provide guidance, support, and solutions focused on skill development, evidence gathering and synthesis, knowledge exchange, product development, and expertise in implementation and adoption of best practices. Today's presentation will focus on our seminal demonstration project. At the time of our launch, it was important to test our model in practice both to demonstrate our capacity and unique skill set as it related to KT, but most importantly to showcase the value of this novel investment. And so to achieve these goals, we launched a call for ideas to identify science to practice gaps in the hospital. Ultimately, the primary gap that we chose concerned the under-recognition of chronic pain among children with cerebral palsy. This is an important issue Quite simply, pain cannot be effectively managed if it's not recognized. Our clinicians pinpointed that they did not have the right tools to guide their pain assessment practice, and they wanted to incorporate a more standardized approach to ensure all clients receive the same clinical experience. And so with a clear knowledge gap, available research literature, and leading clinical experts accessible to guide the work, we set about to co-create a solution with the aim of developing a pain assessment toolbox. And the remainder of this talk will showcase the work undertaken within this demonstration project. So I'd like to pass um, the presentation over to Erin Brandon to talk about the issue of pain in children with cerebral palsy. Thanks, Shauna. I have to say I love this picture as an introduction to discussing pain in children with cerebral palsy as it so nicely displays the variability of functional abilities for three incredible little superheroes of a similar age group who have CP. In this section, we're going to take some time to discuss chronic pain in children and youth with cerebral palsy. We will also look at how pain may present differently from other populations that you may work with in your clinical setting and why capturing their pain experience is so important to their overall quality of life. The definition of chronic pain is rather difficult to pin down as it is defined differently in many different places. But generally, chronic pain is considered pain that lasts longer than three to six months, although some groups consider that greater than six months is the minimum required duration to classify pain as chronic. Another popular definition defines chronic pain as pain that involves no fixed duration of time, but rather is pain that extends beyond the expected period of healing that we may typically anticipate. For the purposes of this project, we define chronic pain as being pain that is experienced for longer than three months in duration. This assisted us with being able to capture a wide breadth of the, of the literature that would be available to us. 
For kids with disabilities, there is an increased risk for them to experience chronic pain more than other populations. As such, it is important to understand how this can impact their daily lives and functional abilities. Chronic pain is associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances, and insomnia, and may also contribute to decreased physical activity due to fear of exasperating pain. In addition to these, individuals with chronic pain tend to also experience impairment in their attention, memory, mental flexibility, communication, speed and response times with cognitive tasks, and execution of structured tasks. The take home here is that chronic pain can have a big impact on the daily lives of children who are experiencing it on a regular basis. For children and youth with CP, this is no different. Pain directly impacts their daily functioning, and it is also unfortunate to report that their pain tends to go under-recognized and under-treated. For nonverbal patients with CP, this is especially true. As you can imagine, nonverbal kids have that many more barriers to identifying their pain experiences than others and have been shown to have ratings of pain in the moderate to severe pain levels. This under-recognized and under-treated pain can then have a great impact on a child's school attendance, participation and inclusion, and overall quality of life. As cerebral palsy can affect the whole body, there are many potential sources for pain. This list of differentials was compiled through a review of the literature as well as through expert opinion and are important to consider in your differential diagnosis as clinicians. In addition to this, it is also important to remember that pain does not always present in the same manner for each individual and ruling out all possibilities or all possible sources of pain is key. Another consideration to keep in mind during your assessment is the differences in cognitive and communication abilities of the kids that you are assessing in clinics. As their abilities and accuracy to report the pain that they are experiencing is a valuable component to consider when trying to tease out the impact that pain is having on their lives on a daily basis. There are many multi-system etiologies for the potential underlying causes for pain in children and youth with CP. This wide differential of sources of pain can make identification, measurement, and treatment all the more challenging. As clinicians, not only is it important to tease out that underlying source of pain and provide treatment, but it is also essential to be able to monitor measurable outcomes to ensure that pain does not go unrecognized. If we remember our initial picture with our three little superheroes, you can see here from this graph that those three children may experience pain differently across, across their lifespan. This study of 252 children with CP showed the variability of pain occurrence among individuals with different growth motor function classification scale levels. The rate of pain is not equal or the same across the different GMSDS levels. And in fact, an increase in, fact in functional limitation directly impacts the rate of pain that an individual with CP may experience. When we take the pain experience for children with CP one step further and look at the World Health Organization's International Classification of Function, Health, and Disability Model for framework, which is a classification system that provides a modern way of thinking about overall health and functioning. We can see that pain not only has a direct impact on an individual's body and health, but it also affects their activity and participation in both environmental and personal aspects of their life as well. It is also important to note that this process is bi-directional and can equally impact the pain experience at any given time. This is key to consider as clinicians, as our primary goal in rehabilitation is to increase activity, participation, and inclusion for all children and youth. This really should motivate us to make pain prevention a number one priority. Because of the multiple pain etiologies in kids with CP, it can often be hard to assess pain. Similarly, it can be difficult to treat an, as the underlying cause of pain is 
so often multifactorial. Because of this, we actually have quite limited tools for assessing pain in kids with cerebral palsy. But how do we find a good tool when the scope of pain is so difficult to determine in this population? When does recurrent intermittent pain become chronic pain? We also know that the pain report will vary depending on the measure used and the questions being asked. In research about pain, the gold standard is self-report. And when possible, we should be finding out directly from kids if they are, are, are not experiencing pain. However, in our population, where some kids are unable to self-report, maybe because of their age, their developmental level, or communication challenges, is a caregiver's report a reasonable proxy? The answer to this is that it may provide a good correlation, but it's not an excellent capture of the pain experience. And as clinicians, we are simply not as good as, our, as children's parents at identifying or knowing if a child is or is not having pain. In these cases, it is important as a clinician to consider the whole picture and not just a snapshot in time. It is also essential to ask, ask probing questions that will provide a better understanding of the lived experiences and impact on daily functioning that pain may be having in a child's life on a daily basis. Many of you may be well familiar with Dr. Failings and her contributions to research for children and youth with cerebral palsy. She has a vast expertise in child development and is the head of the Division of Developmental Pediatrics and an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Currently, she is the physician director of the Child Development Program here at Holland Bloorview and is, is a senior scientist with the Bloorview Research Institute. Her research focuses on the innovation and evaluation of interventions for children specifically with cerebral palsy. Her quote here on the evaluation of pain in children really summarizes the importance of us as clinicians to tease out if children are having pain. The evaluation of pain, as earlier mentioned, is multifaceted and cannot solely focus on a single response to the age-old question, do you have pain, as children and youth may have difficulty articulating what pain is for them. It's important to have a standardized process in place to assess and monitor their individual pain experience over time. This is why developing a chronic pain toolbox for implementation into practice was so important to us. And now I'll turn it over to Christine, who will discuss more about the toolbox and its development. Thanks, Erin. So Evidence to Care uses the knowledge to action cycle as the framework to guide our activities. What I'm going to do is take you through the stages of the pain project as it relates to the knowledge to action cycle. In the knowledge to action cycle, knowing the problem is the first step. So as Erin just mentioned, for children with cerebral palsy, pain assessment is often challenged because there are multiple sources of pain, limited tools for assessment, or communication could be a challenge. This leads to pain being under-recognized and under-treated. And as Shauna articulated, at Holland Blurview, we knew that chronic pain was recognized as a concern by clinicians, that it was being assessed, but mostly through subjective and various methods, and that there was a need to objectively identify, assess, and track chronic pain over time. So this created an opportunity for evidence to care to support clinicians to address this evidence to practice gap. And it was decided that we needed a compendium of resources to address this problem. Knowing the problem allowed us to focus our review and synthesis of the research evidence around chronic pain, chronic pain assessment tools, and pain in children with cerebral palsy as well as inform our approach to put together a compendium of resources and ultimately develop a chronic pain toolbox. To create the toolbox, we went through a series of steps. We completed a structured review of clinical practice guidelines, and from this process, the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario's best practice guideline for the assessment and management of pain was selected as the foundation for our work. The recommendations from the RNAO are not disability focused. So to complement them, we developed clinical practice points in partnership with clinicians. We also conducted a comprehensive systematic review of the pediatric chronic pain tools literature. With the help of Holland Review experts, the toolbox is tailored for children with disabilities. 
We also created an interprofessional working group of clinicians, parents, management, et cetera, to help guide this work. The Chronic Pain Toolbox consists of four components. There is a toolbox background, which provides an in-depth review of the methodology behind the toolbox. There is a pediatric chronic pain assessment tool, which provides a description of the chronic pain assessment tool. There are clinical practice points, which were developed to inform decision making when assessing chronic pain, as well as an implementation supports manual, which was created to guide the adoption, implementation, and evaluation of the toolbox within your own setting. The link to the toolbox is www.hallandblurview.ca slash toolbox, so please download your free copy. To tailor the toolbox at Hall and Blurview, we started with rollout in three clinics so that we could implement, learn about how it's being used in practice, modify, and then re-implement it to better fit the needs of the target clinics and their clients. To do this, we used an integrated knowledge translation strategy by working with a variety of different stakeholders. We met with our interprofessional working group to find out how they could see the toolbox being used at Hall and Blurview. And they helped us to identify the Childhood Development Program, Outpatient Program at Home Blurview as the right audience. We felt that it would be wise to start with smaller, more manageable pilot groups of clinics to test and modify the product with before rolling it out further. We identified 15 tools to help assess chronic pain. Seven tools assess chronic pain interference and eight tools assess chronic pain coping. And we knew that rolling out 15 tools in the clinics would not be feasible. So we met with all of our clinicians for each clinic to review the tools. Clinicians had an in-depth discussion about all the tools and looked at elements such as time to complete the tool and GM FCS levels that the tool could be used with. After this process was completed, we landed on four tools to implement across the clinic. These tools are a mix of observational and self-report tools, as well as a combination of the two. So I'm going to highlight a few activities that we used to test and modify the toolbox prior to rolling it out in the other clinics. We recruited pain champions from each clinic who became the go-to person for the pain project. Champions were a highly valuable role when implementing the toolbox. They are known to their clinical colleagues and have the clinical expertise to action this product. We implemented an education campaign, which we co-led with the manager of quality to provide education around pain, the toolbox, and the tools. We could not assume that the implementing clinics had the same background around pain, and we wanted to ensure everyone was working from the same knowledge base. We also employed a huddle strategy so that we could share successes, address any barriers and challenges as they came up throughout implementation. The huddles were a way for clinicians to solve challenges among themselves or for evidence to care to help address them. To support implementation of the toolbox and documentation of pain, we looked to the electronic medical record in our patient charting system. We work with the clinicians to optimize a screen to document pain assessment practice, including all types of pain, as well as pain tool scores and pain management recommendations. We reviewed the screen with clinicians from both phases and modified it as necessary, and we have just recently finalized the pain screen. So I'd like to turn it over to Ashley, who will talk about the evaluation of the toolbox. All right, thanks, Christine. So I'm going to discuss the monitoring and evaluation techniques that we used for this project. Uh, we set up our plan at the beginning and we wanted to learn about the experiences of clinicians and other key project members. We wanted to improve practices and activities during the course of the project and to make informed decisions on the future of the pain project. And we did this in a few ways. We conducted a document review of the huddle notes that Christine was just speaking to. We conducted interviews with clinicians project developers, and the project steering committee. We conducted baseline and monthly data review of pain assessment documentation in our electronic medical record, and we completed a client and family survey. So first, I'd just like to highlight some of the data that we have in our chronic pain assessment EMR screen. Um, it was uh, captured from March to December 2014, and in that time, we had 254 children with CP complete a pain screen. 
of the 254, 74 children indicated that they had pain, and of those, 72, or 98% of them, uh, received a pain assessment, and it was recorded in the EMR. Here's a breakdown of the assessment methods that clinicians used. Across the 72 children that received a pain assessment, all of the tools were used at least twice, which reflects the heterogeneity characteristics of children with cerebral palsy. Um, different methods of assessment, such as narrative assessment, make sense in select cases because there's no one tool that fits the, fits the needs of all children. Uh, as you can see, the pediatric pain profile in blue, dark blue, uh, was the most used tool. And it's our primary observational tool for children who are non-communicative. This chart highlights clinician-identified information that they gleaned from using the tools for the past year. They reported on the average time it takes to complete, them, uh, complete the tool, the GMFCS levels that they found they could use the tools with, and the strengths and limitations that they found from using each tool. So just as an example, the pediatric pain profile, again in dark blue, um, it was the most used tool, and they identified that it takes an average of 16 to 20 minutes to complete it can be used with children ranging from GMFCS level 1 through 5, and that it's great to use with children that are non-communicative and monitor pain over time. But it does have some limitations. Clinicians identify that it's limiting because there's an open time frame with which to assess pain, and that the pain behaviors that are listed on the tool are not characteristic of pain across all the clients that they see. Pain has always been a priority at Holland Blairview. However, clinicians identify that the development and implementation of the pain toolbox had raised awareness of the need for explicit chronic pain assessment. Other impacts of the pain project identified in our evaluation include uh, standardizing pain assessment practice, increased access to and use of validated chronic pain assessment tools, increase in the use of language specific to pain, so for example, saying to a client, do you experience pain versus do you experience discomfort? It also created special attention to chronic pain as a separate issue and created documentation efficiencies in a centralized EMR screen. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Erin, who's going to talk about a case example from her clinic using the toolbox. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I'd like to talk to you and introduce you to Maddie. Uh, for privacy and confidential reasons, her name has been changed for this case study. This is a case that really brings together the multifaceted and... Erin, can I just interrupt for just a second? Sure. Yeah, it, so it sounds like you're sitting quite a bit further away from the phone than some of the other presenters, so you, you're, you're actually quite quiet and people are having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. If you could just maybe move a little bit closer or make sure you're, you're focusing your, your voice right on that telephone so we can make sure we hear everything you're saying. No problem. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. So this is Maddie. Um, this case really pulls together how pain assessment is not always easy and it doesn't come across clearly with children with cerebral palsy. Um, for the purposes of this case study, Maddie's name has been changed. So Maddie is a six-year-old female with faster quadriplegia. Her GMFCS level is a 5. She's nonverbal and requires assistance with all activities of daily living. She feeds orally, has a history of reflux and constipation, and also has a history of hip subluxation with 35% uncovered on her left side and 50% uncovered on the right. She uses a manual wheelchair for her mobility, has ankle foot orthotics, and gets up in a standard daily for weight-bearing activities. She presented to clinic with complaint of poor sleep for the past three and a half months by her mother. Her mother also reports that every night Maddie wakes up four to five times, is irritable and fussy, and requires frequent repositioning. This lack of sleep is impacting her participation in school, with her frequently being drowsy and having difficulty participating and engaging in activities while she's attending. Her mother also notes that Maddie often returns from school with a full lunch bag. Um, the question that her mom has is, should she be keeping Maddie home from school so that she's able to rest during the day? 
When we dove in further to find out more about Maddie's history, her mom reports that she does not have any history of seizures, but is reported to be arching her back occasionally when being held. She was recently assessed by an ophthalmologist, and her vision was reported to be fine. She's also been for a routine cleaning and checkup as a dentist and has no cavities. She enjoys music and responds appropriate to her name being called, and her mother does not have any concerns about her hearing. She has had an occasional cough, more so at night, uh, and also is having some on and off noisy breathing when she's lying in a flat position. She's had no history of hospital admissions, no treatment with antibiotics, and has no underlying cardiac concerns. Her immunizations are up to date, and she has no known allergies. When we dove into her appetite, her mother did report that it has decreased and she feels that, she, that Maddie's not as interested in food anymore. She also feels that there's a possibility that she's lost a bit of weight since her last assessment in clinic. Maddie has continued on an anti-reflux medication once a day that was prescribed two years prior. She's having bowel movements every two to three days that is often difficult for Maddie to pass and is voiding well. There is no report of increased care provision with her dressing or diaper changes. Her mother feels that she's comfortable with no signs of pain in relation to her hips. Maddie continues to tolerate her wheelchair and stander for extended periods of time, and there's also no reported skin breakdown. At night, Maddie sleeps in her own bed in a, soup, in a lying flat, and she wakes up four to five times at night, and her mother will hold her in an upright position, and then Maddie will be able to uh, settle back to sleep. So what do you think is going on with Maddie? Why is she not sleeping at night? This case highlights a lot of difficult questions that you may have around pain assessments in your own settings. How long is long enough? How do we measure pain in a child who is nonverbal? Maddie can't self-report, so how is her mom assessing her pain? Is there a particular tool that can help to quantify her pain level? How do we start to sort out the cause of her pain and the causes for her sleep disturbances? This is also an interesting case as it doesn't present with the typical signs of pain that we, um, we typically think of or anticipate, like crying. It really highlights that pain can present differently with every child. In Maddie's case, some key findings that have been highlighted in, during the health history, like arching, noisy breathing when lying down, occasional cough, decreased appetite, constipation, possible weight loss, frequent nighttime waking, um, disturbances when lying flat, and comfort when being held in the upright position really starts to highlight and pull together the whole picture. During the assessment, um, it was, we were able to see that me, Maddie started refluxing with positional changes. She had difficulty lying flat without getting irritable or regurgitating. Her, breath was, or sorry, her breathing was also started to sound uh, louder after being in a lying flat position with transmitted upper airway sounds. In addition, she also had a palpable stool mass in her right lower quadrant and had lost 100 grams since her last assessment in clinic. This combined with the health history helped to identify that Maddie was having pain secondary to reflux in combination of constipation and a low dose of a reflux medication. Uh, by identifying her underlying source for her pain, over the next month, we were able to resolve her reflux by elevating her, the head of her bed, increasing her anti-reflux medication, and getting a, bowel, a better bowel routine in place. Maddie started eating better, gaining weight, sleeping through the night, and as such, she started engaging more and participating more at school. So for this case, it's, re it's really important to consider, in all cases, picking the right tool for the patient or client. When possible, if a child is able to report their pain experience, that it's my first go-to to go to the child and ask how they are feeling. I also like in those cases with a verbal child or communicative child to utilize the child activity limitation tool or the CALI that Ashley uh, earlier talked about. 
In addition with that, I also like to use a simple body diagram um, that can pull the whole picture and uh, really identify the target areas that the child is experiencing pain. Uh, but if we recall from the case for Maddie, she was nonverbal and unable to communicate her own pain experience. For this reason, I selected the Pediatric Pain Profiler, the PPP, in Maddie's case. This tool is designed to provide ongoing assessment and monitoring of pain in children with severe neurological disabilities who are unable to report their pain experience. It is a 12-item single ordinal scale that provides ranking between 0 to 60, and any score identified over 14 out of 60 indicates significant pain. I found that this tool is easy to use in the clinical setting and very helpful also to provide to the family for ongoing monitoring in the home setting and evaluation of the treatment plan that we've put in place. For Maddie, she ranked 20 out of 60, placing her in the moderate range for pain assessment and highlighting that day in clinic that intervention was required. So just to look at the uh, benefits for documenting these pain assessments and their pain rankings when you're seeing them in clinic, I've found it very important important for the reevaluation of outcomes of pain and chronic pain in children with CP due to the big impact that they may have on their daily lives. I feel that it's been beneficial to be able to look back on previous assessments of my own as well as of my colleagues to see where these kids are plateauing or increasing in their pain and being able to intervene at an earlier point in time. It's these pain assessments provide great insight for reevaluation of patient goals, outcomes, and treatment planning for the future. Assessing for chronic pain in uh, children with cerebral palsy has become second nature during the health history and physical exam in my own clinical setting. As many of my other colleagues in acute care settings refer to pain as the fifth vital sign, I too consider this assessment for chronic pain to be as important as asking if a child is having any difficulty with breathing. I will continue to utilize this resource in my own clinical setting and hope that many of you will consider its implementation in your own. Areas where I would like to see further evaluation in my clinical setting is in the community with these kids. Time constraints and resources have impacted my ability to be able to get pre and post measures completed by families and children in their home and school environments. But I really see the value in this being tracked and think that this could capture pain and provide intervention or treatment before it escalates to the moderate or severe levels where we seem to be finding it in the clinical setting. As well, this could have a great impact on a child's daily functioning, participation, and overall quality of life. If our number one goal here is to increase participation and inclusion for all children with CP, then pain evaluation has to be made a priority. That's great. Thanks so much, Erin. We uh, really value hearing your clinical opinion. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that we're currently in the process of uh, sustaining use of the toolbox long term at Holland Blurview. So some activities that we're undertaking, uh, we're updating the EMR screen to streamline the content and make sure it continues to be a useful place for clinicians to document their pain assessment. Also to ensure that the contents continue to stay up to date with the latest research, we will plan to update the recommendations, practice points, and tools following the RNAO update uh, of their pain uh, best practice guideline, uh, which usually happens every two to five years. Lastly, we will be integrating education modules delivered either in person or online as part of the fellows educational program and the clinical staff onboarding process. I'd just like to take a moment to thank our colleagues uh, for which this work would have not been possible. And thank you to everybody for joining the webinar today. Uh, we're going to take questions, but um, fear not, if you still have a question after the webinar, you're welcome to contact, contact us at etc at hollandblurview.ca, and we'll get back to you shortly. Thanks so much.
All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks to the whole team there. And we'll leave that contact information up uh, just uh, so that everyone can get a chance to write that down if they do have questions for you after this. Uh, so that's etc at hollandblurview.ca. Uh, we did have a couple questions come in. Um, the first one was right uh, at the beginning uh, when you were talking about, I believe, the the um, the models that you were using to develop the toolkit. Uh, you, you mentioned a bi-directional model, and David was just wondering if you could give a practical example of how the model is bi-directional. Sure. Do you remember which speaker spoke to the bi-directional model? Was it Shauna or Christine? Uh, I don't remember which of you uh, it was that was that, that actually was presenting that portion. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. We're just trying to contextualize the comment so we can best respond to it. I mean, from a bi-directional sense, when we think about the literature on knowledge translation and our evidence care model, we definitely have consideration of both um, producer push and user pull in terms of the types of activities that we do. So, you know, when we think about developing the toolbox, it was both in response to a very clearly identified need and uh, provided an opportunity to develop a tailored product to roll it out within the hospital. But we also recognize that there's lots of um, opportunities um, clinicians and health professionals and community partners who are serving children with cerebral palsy in the community. So one of the things that we didn't speak to is our large push strategy that we've built around this product. So opportunities like today's webinar, conferences, promotional materials, uh, media stories, website showcasing, um, Twitter and Facebook, we've been active, actively engaged in all of those mediums to be able to push our product out and raise awareness uh, about it for other potential users. I don't know if there's anything else the team would like to add around thinking about a bi-directional model in terms of our evidence to care model. Uh, yeah, no, I, we'll see if that uh, answered his question. David, if you have any uh, other follow-up questions to that, please do go ahead and type them in. Uh, the next question was uh, talking about uh, a lot of the case studies and, and examples you were using were in reference to children with cerebral palsy. Um, but they, the question, the person asking the question is uh, suggesting that the title is about children with disabilities in general. Is the toolbox helpful for all kids with disabilities or is it really targeted for children with cerebral palsy? Um, I think it, it was originally developed for children with cerebral palsy, but we do recognize that um, for children with physical disabilities, there could be a benefit to using this toolbox. Um, so we do encourage people to take a look at the pain assessment recommendations and the practice points and the tools and see how they could fit um, their population. So for example, we did test the toolbox in a, in a Rett syndrome population. Um, and some of the questions weren't uh, quite uh, accurate for that population, but it doesn't mean it couldn't work, say, for example, in spina bifida or other physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. This is Sean here. One of the other things I'll add is that when we look to the research literature um, and we're looking at pediatric chronic pain assessment tools, they kind of fall into two camps. One is for typically developing children who experience chronic pain, and then the content of those tools is very much um, aligned with the perspective that the pain is the disabling element, and if you remove the pain, then uh, the functional limitations disappear. And the other body of literature, which is where our broader perspective of, um, of calling the toolbox, the toolbox for children with disabilities, is that when you look at tools that are designed or have been developed for populations of children with physical disabilities, um, very few are specific to one diagnosis, but rather have been developed for you know, a broader group of children, so children with um, severe neurodevelopmental disorders or children with verbal limitations. And when you look at the validation of the tools, they do pick up a broader um, heterogeneous group of children. So much of our practice recommendations uh, were specifically tailored uh, and guided by CP experts, but the tools themselves have a broader applicability to children with disabilities. And then as, excuse me, as Ashley mentioned, one of the things that we've been very interested in our evaluation efforts is to understand the transportability of the toolbox. 
both in terms of application to other diagnoses, but also other settings. So not just a outpatient rehab setting, um, community practices. Um, and so one of the things that we're very interested in looking at is working with other potential partners to uh, better understand what the broad applicability uh, of it is. Uh, but we feel as a toolbox for children with disabilities uh, that this is something that clinicians should definitely look to uh, as a potential resource specifically for children with CP, but also consideration of other populations who share very similar presentations uh, and multiple comorbidities and complexities as Aaron outlined. Uh, Carl has a question about pain that is provoked versus pain at rest. So, for example, stretching, exercise, or being moved, etc. Is pain is provoked pain considered chronic? And are there any implications for pain assessment? So, I think. Um when we go back to the, all the differential diagnosis of pain for, and I was talking very much about children with cerebral palsy, but yes, there can be some pain that's uh, provoked and uh, or iterogenic causes of pain, uh, which are com important to consider. So especially for kids with disabilities, there can be pain that is uh, related to stretching or bracing. Um, and can have some very negative impacts on these children that we need to consider. Um, so it's also taking that into, into your clinical assessment and ensuring that those durations of time are not greatly impacting the children that you're seeing and providing negative memories or negative impact on them associated with those brief uh, time period and um, physical activity. I would also add that often some of those types of pain inducing experiences would fall under um, procedural pain. So Botox injections, you know, needles, other things that create an acute experience. But I think when we think about children with cerebral palsy who uh, will be undergoing and experiencing active rehab activities, and then if they have chronic pain that those um, stretching exercises may not, if there wasn't any underlying pain, may have less of an impact or a shorter duration, but could really be uh, exacerbating and creating a very serious situation depending on the nature of the chronic pain that they're experiencing. So certainly one of the things, and this speaks to Christine's point around um, common, a common understanding of the range of pain and how pain presents was a key piece of our knowledge translation strategy when we looked at implementation. So the education pieces that, um, that were led by our manager of um, patient safety and quality really talked about pain, focusing on both acute pain, procedural pain, as well as chronic, to kind of raise awareness more broadly, even those specific pieces that we were trying to um, accelerate or drive or specific to chronic pain, but the whole pain picture needs to be considered um, in a clinical setting. Uh, Gail has asked a question. Um, she was wondering if the pediatric pain profile is being used in other centers uh, such as SickKids, if, if you have any knowledge of it being used anywhere else. Um, so the pediatric pain profile was developed in the UK. Um, they have a website. You can go download all the information there. As far as other centers specifically using that tool, there are none that I'm directly aware of. Um, we have a partnership with a hospital called Gillette in the US, and they're currently in the process of implementing the toolbox and choosing their sets of tools, so it is very possible that for their children who are non-communicative, that they will be choosing the PPP. Um, but other than that, not that I'm aware of. I know one of the reasons why the uh, RNAO guideline and pain was a priority for us to focus on is that prior to our work focusing on our outpatient clinics, um, the pain guideline has been implemented on our inpatient clinics. 
and the teams between SickKids and Holland Blurview had worked closely to create mechanisms so that the acute tools that were being used um, at SickKids were then uh, reused uh, upon transfer to Holland Blurview so that there was continuity in the uh, pain assessment process. And we've been having active discussions with our inpatient nursing staff to look at opportunities to um, broaden their focus from acute pain. And many of the children are, are transferring directly after surgery or in very much their acute rehab stage to also thinking about how they can be assessing chronic pain. So I think through those conversations, there will also be an opportunity to again look at when we're looking at our acute transfer partners and how we can standardize and have a common evidence base um, that we're drawing from in terms of pain assessment um, practices more broadly. All right, well, Catherine uh, in Vancouver uh, put in a comment that said Sunny Hill, uh, so, uh, the Sunny Hill Health Center, I think is the full name there, but the rehab center associated with BC Children's, they, they use the pediatric pain profile as well. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, Gail went on to ask, uh, following that question, she, uh, she, ha she says, if you have a child, so regarding the pediatric pain profile, if you have a child that's nonverbal, the pediatric pain profile asks about pain A, B, and C. If you cannot identify the source, do you just do it once overall? Sorry, can you repeat, repeat that question again? I don't know if you about the portion of if you cannot identify the source, do you only do it once? Yeah, so I guess she's just looking about the application of the tool. If you can't, if you if you go through the process and you can't identify the source, sort of what's your next step? I think is maybe what she's asking. I think for for in my own clinical setting, if I'm unable to identify a source for pain, then it's something that needs requires further investigation. So it would be looking to your diagnostic tools, your um, collaborative colleagues uh, to identify what's really going on and maybe there's something that you are missing as well as continuing to evaluate to see if that pain escalates or if it maintains the same and whether that's actually that patient's baseline of pain level that they're able to function uh, well at. All right. Uh, what has been your experience with the pain behavior checklist? Uh, they are looking for uh, looking at a checklist in the hospital because the pediatric pain profile takes a while to complete where the checklist uh, looks m quicker and easier to use. Um, uh, the pain behavior checklist did come up in our systematic review. However, it wasn't included in the toolbox. And I'll be honest, off the top of my head, I cannot remember why, but we don't have any experience using that tool. So I can't answer that question, unfortunately. I can oh. possibly touch base on it using it in an acute care setting. I think that gives you a snapshot in a very limited time period of assessing, of, of assessing kind of more acute pain. I don't think it gives a good capture of, uh, or it, it didn't in my own practice, of over a longer duration of time and being able to actually bring the whole picture into play and the child's experience it's more of an observational tool than it is um, more holistic and considering the quality of life aspects that there might be impacting for that patient. And this is Shawnee here. Maybe I'll just comment and give a bit more of background on the process we went through to select the 15 tools. So, um, we probably, through our systematic review, identified over 100 pain assessment tools that were identified in either pain uh, assessment development papers, in research studies, and we reviewed them all and screened them to ensure that, um, that they were a chronic pain assessment measure as opposed to acute. Um, often we found in research studies they might be using the tool in a different way than it had originally been developed. So we screened to make sure that the focus of the tool was on chronic pain assessment, um, that it focused on pediatrics. Uh, and as I was describing earlier, we looked at a broad range of tools. We didn't limit exclusively to children with cerebral palsy uh, with the plan or the intent to pick up tools that um, were suitable for children with disabilities, 
but also recognizing the broad um, presentation on heterogeneity uh, of CP, that you have children who are high functioning and can self-report, um, and thus may be suitable to you know, a more generic pediatric um, assessment tool. And then at the other um, end of the continuum, you have children for whom you'll need to rely on a proxy tool. Once we have our short list, we looked at other criteria that we applied were that the tool had been validated for uh, an English-speaking um, audience. And I will um, comment that there are at least two pain assessment tools specifically developed for children with CP, but they haven't been validated in English. Uh, and anybody interested, we'd be happy to provide the uh, references for that. And they're on our tools to watch as we look to update um, the toolbox. We also were looking at tools in their entirety. So in many instances, a subset of the tool is pulled out. But we were looking at tools that could be used um, you know, with all subsets. We were looking for tools that would be efficient to use. Um, we closely examined the types of questions that were asked to make sure that they were relevant for our rehab setting. As I was saying earlier, some of the tools that were designed for um, non-disabled populations there was some concern that the content um, wasn't appropriate in terms of how uh, disability was conceptualized. And we looked very much to both our experts, uh, from our clinical experts, as well as our uh, parents who were part of the project, um, to understand you know, how families would react to some of the questions, whether they were appropriate to use, and whether they would give us meaningful information. So the subset of tools that are included are the, um, as Christine said, there's seven tools that assess pain interference. Um, we felt from our review that these were the most suitable, um, but there isn't one perfect tool. And then the coping pain tools are also included in the toolbox. There's less evidence about their use for children with disabilities, but our clinical experts uh, among our working group very much felt that once um, chronic pain had been identified and a management system was in place that it was also important to understand at a later level um, how coping was being impacted. Our focus of the rollout has been very much on prioritizing the pain conversation and getting the assessment tools uh, into people's hands in order to uh, enhance current levels of pain assessment practice. I had a uh, next question came in from uh, Michelin, uh, who's in Ottawa, the Ottawa Children's Treatment Center. And this is a fairly generic question, so Michelin, you may have to uh, give us a little more detail, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway and see if our uh, presenters can do anything with this. But she's just asking if she's saying she wanted to use this toolbox in her practice at OCTC in Ottawa as a nurse in a medical clinic. And she's just wondering if she could get some feedback. No, I know that sounds a little generic, but I, I'm not sure if she's asking specifically if that's an appropriate setting in a medical clinic of, to use the toolbox or just as a nurse in that in that situation, if you have any thoughts to, to help her use the tool more effectively. Well, I think our first comment is that's fantastic news. Uh, we'd love to hear that. Um, and um, I'll pass it over to our other partners to give um, some of the other presenters a chance to comment. I think that it's totally applicable to implement in a medical setting. A lot of uh, the follow-up or developmental assessments that we're doing in clinic is um, very similar to um, like an outpatient clinic. Um, I think that it's very, it has been very easy to utilize. And it's probably already something that you are doing in clinic is asking if there's pain. It's just taking it that one step further and really honing in on the chronic pain experience and how that's impacting these uh, children or your, the clients that you're seeing in everyday life. All right. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to, to also recommend, um, we have an implementation supports manual. So if you go to hallandblurview.ca slash toolbox, the fourth component um, gives clinicians strategies for how to implement the toolbox in their context, whatever that may be. Um, so I would recommend that she review that, as well as reviewing the tools. And we have details about the tools, so she could probably choose one or two of those that would fit um, the pace of her clinic and clinic flow, and then feel free to email us if she has any specific um, context-based questions, and we, we would be happy to help. 
once again, the email address is still up on the screen for those of you for those of you who do want to connect directly with the uh, evidence to care team at etc at hollandblurview.ca. Uh, we did have another question uh, come in about um, uh, from Gail, who's asking for children with chronic pain. Have you developed uh, pain passports? And if you did, do you have any copies of uh, that sort of, of tool that you could share? Um, I, I, I'm assuming, I, well, I'm guessing she means children that have chronic pain as their disability, not a disability and chronic pain. Um, so we do have a chronic, a new chronic pain program here at Holland Blurview, um, but I'm not sure if they have pain passports. It's a possibility. Um, we don't have one that is connected to the toolbox, but if Gail wants to email us, um, her contact information, we can ask our chronic pain clinic team to see if they have something. I think one of the things is we love to update the toolbox and through our um, uh, experiences working with other partners and rolling out the toolbox, opportunities to enhance the content uh, and the utility of um, the implementation manual uh, be it through other exemplars of pain documentation screens, care pathways, or just, you know, other practical resources that uh, people will find useful to help um, support its adoption. Those are all things that we're gathering information on and hoping to understand better about how we could enhance the utility and the transportability uh, of the work. So we're certainly open to suggestions and recommendations and hearing about other people's experiences about how they're looking to um, optimize best practices around chronic pain assessment that might inform our thinking uh, as we look to the future and what version 2.0 uh, could look like. All right, well we've got one final question here, so if anyone does have any other questions that they're desperate to ask, please uh, start typing them now and we can get them uh, in before we wrap up. Um, but if we don't have anything else, then, uh, then we're going to wrap up after this next question. But uh, this one comes from uh, Francesca, who is a child life specialist in Louisiana, and she's wondering if you guys have ever used uh, child life specialists to help in your assessment of pain with your cerebral palsy patients. We absolutely do have child, well, we have child life specialists here at the hospital on our inpatient unit, and we actually have a, a publication that we could share uh, that was developed by uh, one of our child life specialists as well as uh, the individual we spoke about before, our manager of um, client, and, uh, client and family or client safety um, and quality. And they've uh, developed a publication uh, that talks about non-pharmacological approaches to um, helping to minimize and manage pain that's really directed to families. Um, and they hosted a number of workshops um, targeting uh, parents uh, to teach them these methods uh, so that they could um, play an important role um, outside of the hospital or while their child was an in, inpatient in terms of managing uh, pain uh, from that um, particular clinical perspective. So if you'd like to uh, email our team, we can certainly make sure that um, you get the information uh, about that work. Um, but we very much embrace an interprofessional approach um, to pain management. We also have therapeutic clowns that also play a very important role um, in the pain uh, management um, process. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, certainly multidisciplinary. If you're including the clowns as well, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's all we've got for questions now. Uh, we haven't had any more questions come in, so maybe we'll just hand it over to maybe, for maybe a couple comments from the team. I don't know who wants to take the reins on this, but just any any final comments that you'd like to close this off with. Well, we'd just like to thank everybody uh, for joining us today and for the opportunity to um, share the information about our toolbox. We hope that you'll download it and connect with us if you have any questions, and stay tuned for updates. All right. Sounds good. Uh, and once again, that email address uh, to connect with the, the Evidence to Care team is uh, up on the screen, etc at hollandblurview.ca. So as they said, any questions you have for them or uh, anything else you want to connect with them on, uh, go ahead and, and use that email address. I'm sure they appreciate hearing from everyone. 
All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap this up. Uh, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. It's always great if you can watch live because then you get a chance to ask questions as we saw today. But when you can't watch live, the recordings of these sessions are always made available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, later this week, uh, we've got a great presentation from our patient safety collaborative called uh, Planning and Executing a Safe Patient Move, the Montreal Children's Hospital's experience in, from 2015. For those of you who uh, might have been following that, about a month or, month or so ago, I guess it's probably more than a month ago, the MUHC, the McGill University Health Centre, opened their new site, which is the new home to the Montreal Children's Hospital, the Royal Victoria Hospital, the Montreal Chest Institute, the Cancer Centre and Research Institute of the MUHC and, and the Shriners Hospital, and they started moving all of those hospitals into the new site uh, over, over time. Shriners uh, Hospital hasn't moved yet, but this is going to be a great presentation about all the planning and logistics that, go, that were involved in moving an entire hospital. And then next week, we've got uh, the final part of our three-part patient safety series. So we have back-to-back -back patient safety. Uh, the, the series, uh, that series of three was sponsored by Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals, and it's going to be a great session as we hear from two real leaders in our healthcare sector, uh, the former slash retired CEO of the patient, Canadian Patient Safety Institute, Hugh McLeod, and CEO of uh, Kingston General Hospital, Leslie Thompson, are going to uh, talk to us about uh, the roles of patient safety, quality, and patient experience. And as we try to make all these improvements, are we make, making sure that we're keeping all of three of those in mind as we're improving quality? Are we sacrificing safety and as our, and et cetera? So it's going to be a great uh, conversation about what the roles of safety, quality, and patient experience play in, in healthcare improvement. So thanks again, once again to our team from uh, uh, the Evidence to Care team at Holland Blue Review. It was a great uh, presentation, lots of questions. So we can always we always know that that's a great presentation when uh, we get lots of questions from the audience. So we can tell they're very interested in this topic. So thanks again one more time to, uh, to our team that uh, presented to us today. And uh, we got some great stuff, as I mentioned, coming up next uh, in the next few weeks. And so thanks for joining us today, and we hope to see you back here next week. Bye, everyone.